Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, I have just a couple housekeeping things before we get into the rest of the webinar. I know that some people emailed us questions and we're going to try to address those in our slide uh, presentation as we go through. But if you do have other questions that come up, um, there is a chat box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So you can chat us questions and we'll try to incorporate those into our presentation as well. Um, also, our slideshow is going to incorporate links, and some of those are lengthy to different resources, and so we're going to be sharing the slideshow with everybody once, um, once we're done with the presentation, so you don't have to worry about trying to write out the, the longer links. Um, and then finally, we are recording this webinar, and we're going to be posting it to our various YouTube channels when we're done. So um, if there's anything that you forget or want to be able to share it with other folks who weren't able to attend, just uh, make sure that you're following us on uh, Twitter and Facebook. So with that, I do want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Dawn Oyer. Um, I am currently the Deputy Campaign Director for Rhode Islanders United for Marriage. Um, I have worked for Marriage Equality Rhode Island since the end of 2010 um, and was the Director of Education and Community Outreach for them. Um, and so presenting uh, the, the bulk of today's presentation is going to be Jansen Wu and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jansen Wu. I'm a staff attorney with Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders, GLAD, uh, which is a New England-based uh, legal organization dedicated to ending discrimination based upon sexual orientation gender identity and expression, and HIV status. Um, we are so thrilled to have so many participants in on this webinar. Um, please do send us questions as they come along. I'll do my best to address those. Um, we'll have a little time at the end to address those questions. And I've also um, taken the questions we've already gotten and I've incorporated it into this presentation as well. So hopefully this will be fun and informative at the same time. So just to give you a quick overview, um, we're going to try to cover a lot in a, a short period of time. Um, but some of the things that we'll be talking about today is what you can do, first of all, outside of marriage, because not everyone will get married, um, to protect your family. Um, what you, should you consider before getting married? Um, how do you actually go get married in terms of going to the clerk's office and to the church or wherever else you want to go get married? Um, what will it mean actually legally, both from a state perspective and a federal perspective, to be married? Um, and what happens if you're already married in another state or you have a civil union, either one from Rhode Island or another state? Obviously, some of the biggest topics we've been asked about is around health care and taxes, so I'll be sure to hit upon those two areas. Um, of course, not only will Rhode Islanders be getting the right to marry in Rhode, um, starting on August 1st, but they'll also finally get the right to divorce, which is incredibly important legal protections for so many families to um, disentangle their families. And so we'll be hitting upon that as well, too. And then finally, of course, what you can do best to protect your children. We do have a couple of polls that we're going to ask you throughout this uh, webinar. And so the first poll is, what are you most interested hearing about? Now, I've already kind of created this whole PowerPoint presentation, but if there's certain things that people want to hear more about, I can spend more time or attention on those topics as well, too. And if there's something I didn't think about at all, then I can certainly um, add that in at the end. So please do um, go ahead and answer those questions of what you're most interested in hearing about, and we will get started with the presentation. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say, actually, is that all the information in this webinar is actually in a publication that GLAD um, has uh, put on our website called Rhode Island Marriage Guide for Same-Sex Couples. You can see the link to that. You can find it at www.glad.org. So don't worry so much about jotting down every single detail during this webinar. You can certainly find it in that publication. Um, but also, if you have additional questions, um, coming um, that arise out of this webinar, um, you can also just call us at GLAD. We have an info line that's dedicated to answer your questions, not just about marriage, but all areas of LGBT rights and um, issues facing people living with HIV, such as adoption and custody and housing and employment discrimination and transgender rights. So please do call us whenever you have a question. You can see our phone number at the bottom right. Um, the legal info line is open from 1.30 to 4.30 from Monday to Friday, and we'll do our best to provide you the best legal information possible. So uh, the first slide is 
and you'll start to notice a little theme. I have tried to title every slide with a song lyric. So if you want to play along as well too, anyone who's chatting it up, you can certainly try to guess who sang that song. Um, this one should be pretty easy for most folks. Um, but this first slide I want to talk about um, what people should be doing regardless of whether they're married or not, um, and especially if you aren't married. Um, so many people may not want to marry. Uh, many people, it may not actually make legal sense for them to get married, um, and we'll be talking about that in a second. And then finally, um, oh, and let me just pause and just say that the poll that I just put out there will close after this slide. So this is your opportunity to chime in now. Um, and then finally, even if you do get married, that marriage may not be respected in all states in this country. And so it's, it's what I call the belt and suspenders approach. You just want, you can't be too careful when it comes to protecting your family. And so the various types of documents outside of marriage that you may want to consider um, executing are powers of attorney, uh, which allows your spouse or another person to actually make financial decisions on your behalf if you're unable to, a durable power of attorney for health care, um, which allows another person to make medical decisions for you um, if you're unable to, obviously a will, um, funeral planning documents, a living will, which allows people to uh, dictate how they would like their end-of-life treatment, and then finally, and I, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but I cannot overemphasize the importance of actually doing adoption, even if you are married. Um, all of these documents will just add that extra piece of security for you and your family. And if you need the name and phone number of a good estate attorney who can help you, please call our info line because we have a loyal referral service of attorneys in Rhode Island who can help you um, execute these documents. So the next slide, <laughs> another song that most people should know pretty well. Um, so what are the questions um, that you should consider um, other than whether or not you're fully and head over heels in love and committed to the person that you want to marry. There may be some extra considerations for LGBT couples uh, given the um, continued discrimination against LGBT couples um, throughout um, this country still. Things that uh, straight couples may not have to think about before getting married. The first one is actually getting married can actually um, make it more difficult to do international adoptions. Um, and in fact, this may even be a moot point at this point because I'm not actually aware of any um, international or any countries that actually allow couples or even a single individual person to adopt anymore. They almost are all requiring um, couples to adopt and then most have bans against gay couples adopting. Um, but there had been some couples that will, would allow a single person to adopt and the ways that gay couples were getting around the ban against gay couples or gay individuals adopting was just to adopt as a single person. So that's one consideration. You should certainly talk to a lawyer if you're thinking about an international adoption and as to whether or not a marriage makes sense. Um, there are some government programs that you'll be disqualified for receiving benefits for if you are married, and that's because some programs such as Medicaid um, will look at the income of both you and your spouse, um, but if you're not married, they will just look at your individual income. And so that is certainly a consideration for many individuals. Um, debt obligations. Um, now, marriage comes with both benefits and responsibilities, and those responsibilities are important as well, too. And in Rhode Island, spouses do have obligations to support their spouse, um, including with regards to necessary debts that they may incur, such as hospital fees and costs. Um, inheritance, you actually cannot completely disinherit your spouse unless stated otherwise in a prenup. So if that's a concern for you, that's certainly something to know in advance of getting married. Um, finally, um, divorce and remarriage after divorce. So there are actually, um, of course, nobody gets married thinking they will get divorced. And it's also really important to just take into account all of the possibilities um, that could arise in the future, and one of which, which we see way too often, are couples who get married and then move to a non-recognition state, a state that won't recognize their marriage, um, and then that um, relationship ends and they're unable to dissolve their, um, or, uh, their marriage and divorce their spouse, and so they're actually stuck in these legal relationships. This is the situation that lots of same-sex couples in Rhode Island were in um, after the Chamber's decision by the Supreme Court in Rhode Island that said that gay couples could not have the right to marry. That will change, of course, on August 1st, but that won't fix things in other states as well, too. 
And then finally, remarriage after divorce. This is a, a small point, but if people are uh, receiving Social Security benefits based upon their spouse's earnings or, um, or I'm sorry, their ex-spouse's earnings, then actually remarriage after divorce can make you ineligible for receiving those benefits as well, too. So just some things to keep into mind as you, um, as you embark, if you are not already married. Um, so what are the legal benefits and responsibilities that, that do come with marriage? Of course, there, there are incredibly important protections that do come with marriage. Um, and just briefly, um, um, in test state succession, in case you don't have a will, which you certainly should get a will, as we talked about, um, but if you don't, um, your estate will automatically go to your spouse first. Tenancy by the entirety, if you purchase property together, um, then you will be able to own property together and have the right of survivorship of that property with your spouse only. Um, joint adoption um, often t is tied to your marital status, your ability to get divorced, um, and then finally, you know, small things like marital privilege in court. One person that asked the question, will I be able to collect my partner's state pension in the event he dies? And the, and the answer is yes, you will be able to. Um, um, as long as uh, you are otherwise qualified, and there's certainly age um, um, eligibility requirements for state pensions, as well as the amount of time you have to have worked in the state and whatnot. Um, on the federal side, and we'll be talking a little bit more about this later, but certainly there are very valuable and important federal protections um, to marriage, such as the ability to file your taxes jointly, the ability to um, receive survivor and spouse of social security benefits. So one person asked, can my husband collect social security after my death? And generally, yes, he can now because DOMA has now been overruled. Um, if he dies or in a state that um, would recognize his marriage and you meet the other qualifications that are there that applies to all couples, such as being married for nine months before the person's death. Um, family medical leave is also incredibly important for spouses um, who need to be able to take care of a sick spouse. Um, federal employees receive very valuable benefits through marriage, um, and then spouses of military um, um, service members and veterans as well, too. So um, again, there is much more information in the publications, but these are just some of the things um, that come with marriage that are incredibly important for safety and security of all families. So now, after you know listening to those three slides and you're now convinced this makes sense, let's get married. How do you actually do it? Um, so there's a question of who can get married, and thankfully now Rhode Island will no longer um, prohibit couples who are of the same sex to marry. Um, however, there are other qualifications you have to meet, such as age, um, and so you have to be 18 or over. Um, if you're not, if you're 16, then you just need your parental consent, or if you're under 16, then you need a court order. Um, you have to not be married to somebody else. Um, and this may seem like an obvious point, but you'd be surprised about the situations and calls that we get. Um, and this includes civil unions and domestic partnerships from other states. So if you have a civil union with another person in Vermont um, or New Hampshire or many, one of the other states that had allowed couples to get civil unions, um, you actually have to dissolve that civil union first before you get married to a different person in Rhode Island. And we'll talk, be talking a little bit more about what that means for people out of state. And there's another question that just came up. Um, and actually, can you read that to me? Okay, we will actually get that. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so then, um, actually, we're going to talk about it now. So people who are already married to the same person, um, can you get remarried in Rhode Island? We got a lot of questions about this. So yes, you can get remarried to the same person in Rhode Island. So if you want to renew those vows, if you're looking to, you know, get, you know, uh, collect a uh, marriage in every single state that allows um, gay couples to marry, you can certainly do that. Um, that being said, it's not necessary. So if you were married in New York, if you're married in Florida, if you're married in Massachusetts, there is no need for you to remarry in Rhode Island. That marriage is valid and will be recognized um, in Rhode Island as a marriage. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so hopefully that answers that question. There was also another question as to what the recognized date of out-of-state marriages would be. Um, and what I think the person's asking there is, um, let's say I got married in Massachusetts on February 
uh, sorry, May 17, 2014, when couples could first get married in Massachusetts, um, what's the uh, effective start of my marriage um, in Rhode Island? And it should still be May 17, 2014. That doesn't change. Um, you, that's the effective date of your marriage is whenever you actually got married. So the next question is, where can you get married? Um, and uh, the place to start is the town hall. So you have to go to the town hall um, of where either party lives. Um, you can pick either one if you guys don't live together. Um, if you are non-residents and you're coming to Rhode Island to have um, to get married, then you must go to the town hall where your ceremony will take place. Um, and that's very important. Um, both parties must show up at town hall, so make sure you guys both take the day off of work to stop by. Um, and they're going to ask for some information, and they're going to ask for um, certain types of documentation. Now we're, at, now we're to the what question. Um, so um, make sure you know your social security number. Um, they will also want to know your father and mother's birth name and birthplace. Um, they will want to know about information about previous marriages, civil unions, or domestic partnerships, and if those are with a different person, um, that the fact, the date, and the fact that those previous um, legal relationships were dissolved. Um, some clerk's office may ask for a certificate of divorce or dissolution, um, so please just call the clerk's office in advance to see if you need to bring that, if that applies to you. Um, and then finally, some form of identification. Um, this may vary, again, by clerk's office, so please do call your clerk's office before you go to find out what type of identification they need, um, but usually a uh, passport, birth certificate, driver's license, such advice. And then finally, oh, oh, I'm sorry about that. So, yes, that is right. You cannot get married in Florida. I apologize about that. <laughs> um, and yes, I did not mean to imply that you could get married. The question I said misspoke before about if you got married in Florida, and that certainly is not the case right now, but hopefully soon. Um, and I apologize for any slip-ups like that, but please do catch them for me. It is somewhat distracting to talk and also monitor the chat at the same time. <laughs> um, so finally, the how. Um, what will happen when you go to the clerk's office? Well, the clerk will give you the application to fill out, um, and then they will give you the marriage license. And that marriage license is good for three months. Um, and you can have it solemnized anywhere in Rhode Island, um, unless, you're, again, you're a non-resident, in which case you must have it solemnized in the town where your license was issued. Um, and there's a question about whether there's a waiting period. There is no waiting period in Rhode Island, so you should be able to get that marriage license um, on your first visit to the town clerk's office. Um, so then, after you get the marriage license, you got three months to have it solemnized. Um, how do you do that? Well, you need to find an officiant. Um, and there are lots of questions that we received as to who can actually officiate your wedding. Um, and in Rhode Island, um, ordained clergy can do so, as well as present and former judges and clerks. Um, unfortunately, in Rhode Island, justices of the peace cannot um, officiate weddings. Um, and so uh, some clerk's office may have uh, lists or referrals uh, to certain people who they know in that town who can do the mer can do, who can do the wedding. Um, otherwise, I would suggest asking around or looking of uh, doing some Google searches there too. Finally, you'll need two witnesses at the ceremony, um, and then after the ceremony, the officiant must return the marriage certificate to that town within 72 hours. Um, so just make sure that you have a responsible officiant to make to do that. Um, next slide. So our next poll question is how many of you are actually planning on getting married on August 1st? We would actually love to get a sense of what the uh, interest or demand is on August 1st as we've been working with various town clerks uh, throughout the state to give them a sense of what the demand will be um, on that very first day. And hold on one second while we get another question. And we will pop up the results of that poll as soon as it is done. But let's go to the ne next slide for now. All right, so Don, do you want to take over and just talk a little bit about what it might look like on August 1st, as well as answer some of the questions that people have about how can they actually get married on that day? 
Right. So one of the um, links that we're going to have on the slideshow will be the um, a link to the Department of Health um, DOH, which will have information on basically how do you get married in Rhode Island, and it's their kind of shortcut guide, and it talks through a lot of the logistics that um, Jansen has, has already talked about. One of the things that they're working on right now is updating the forms, and so on the application for a marriage license, there is going to be basically two lines for people to put their name, and you will get to choose if you want to be the bride, the groom, or spouse. So you get to self-identify for, for yourself, um, and the, um, all of the clerks are going to be trained on how to fill out those forms along with all of the other information that you need to provide with that. That was something that we thought was really important so that people um, were able to select. Some people really want to be a bride, some people really don't like that terminology, some people want to be spouse, so um, you will have the option. Um, also, Jansen mentioned a little bit about going to, well, he, he was talking about making sure you're going to the correct clerk's office. The second uh, link there actually lists all of the clerk's offices, and it has contact information. So one of the things I would really recommend is when you're going, when you're planning on going in to pick up your license, because you're having to provide so much documentation and fill out this form, it does take about a half an hour because they have to photocopy documentation and make sure all of the forms are filled out correctly. So make sure you give the clerk's office a call just to make sure you know what their hours are, how late they're planning on being there. Um, you know, if they're closing at 4 o'clock, they probably won't process the marriage license if you show up at 355. So make sure that you, you know the hours, you have all of the information from the town clerks that Jansen previously mentioned about the different um, uh, certified copies of, you know, if you were in a previous relationship or, or um, if you have a birth certificate or any of that other documentation, make sure you're calling the clerk's office and that if there's any issues when you make those phone calls to definitely <coughs> let, um, let us know or call the GLAD uh, info line and, you know, let basically let one of our organizations know. We've been working with the Department of Health and the Clerks Association to make sure that they're all trained and, up, you know, have updated. So we are going to hopefully have a very smooth implementation of this law. But um, so one of the questions was, do we have to wait until August 1st to apply for a license? Um, yes, that is, that is the case. The new forms won't go live until August 1st. Even the Department of Health page link that I have up there right now, that link won't even be updated um, until August 1st. So there's not really a way to apply before the August 1st timeline. But the, the great news is that because there is no waiting period, you'll be able to get married right on August 1st. One of the questions was if you can get married at the, the city or town hall. And again, I think that's, that's a conversation for the clerks and um, to figure out all of the logistics that they're going to want to have. One of the reasons that we wanted to know who's all planning on getting married on August 1st is, as we've seen in other states, that there's a lot of excitement on the day that licenses become available. So we want to make sure that we're helping them manage um, their personnel, their staffing, um, and their expectations. So there, there might be some availability in various city or town halls to have a wedding ceremony on site. Um, and since there's no waiting period, I think if we're able to work with city and town clerks, I think that would be great. Um, and also, as far as who can officiate, we are also able to provide resources on that. We have people con uh, contacting RI United and Mary continuously letting us know that they're um, licensed officiants, and so we can help people if you're having any issues trying to track down somebody to officiate your wedding. Um, we're happy to help you with that. And Dawn, um, we and had a question. Was... Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. That's okay. Oh, uh, we had one more was... question. I didn't know the. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> The question about will the first ceremony be held in the State House and what time will it be held? So we're still working out logistics. I know in other states they have had um, 
you know, midnight openings of city halls around the state. And I think that there's conversations about that happening in Providence, um, but there is nothing set in stone yet. And so we don't have details on any of that information. So um, I can't say I can't say for sure whether or not any city hall will be doing a basically a 1201 opening. But we, at this point, there isn't uh, plans for a first ceremony to happen in the state house. And Dawn, there was a question as to the cost of the marriage license, which I actually didn't know the answer to. I was wondering if you did. The marriage license are uh, they're twenty four dollars, but I do know that there was just legislation passed at the end of um, at the end of the next at the end of this previous uh, legislative cycle that we've actually upped it by I think forty six dollars. So we might it might be um, increased quite a bit, but the last and I don't so I don't know when that new law went into effect, but. At the moment, it's twenty-four dollars, and it could be going up by an additional forty-six. Great, thanks. Um, so we have the results of our poll, um, which shows that seventeen percent of you, seventeen percent of you, are planning on marrying on August first, um, while eighty-three percent of you are not, uh, which is really exciting for those seventeen percent. So congratulations. Um, we've gotten enough questions that about the actual process that I think it might make sense just to go over one more time and I'll just be just hit the bullet points and just maybe say it a little slower. Um, so first of all, out-of-state um, residents can come to Rhode Island to marry. Regardless of where you live, you can come to Rhode Island and get married and you follow the exact same process as residents of Rhode Island do, which I just laid out and I'll lay it out again in a second except that you have to get your marriage license from the town where you want to have your ceremony. So that's the only difference with regards to out-of-state couples. So for those Florida residents who want to come to Rhode Island, come on up. We welcome you with open arms and um, look, forward, look forward to the invitation, I guess. Um, second, what the process is, again, basically is going to the town clerk's office, applying for the marriage license, getting the marriage license, having an officiant solemnize the wedding with two um, witnesses and then having the officiant return that marriage license back to the town clerk where you originally got it within 72 hours. There are no additional requirements to go to the courthouse at all, unless, of course, you are looking to have a uh, current judge or clerk of the court uh, to marry you. Um, and so... Um, if that's the case and you already know of a judge who wants to marry you and is willing to do it and wants to do it in the courthouse, then sure, um, you certainly can go to the courthouse. But there's no requirement for you to go to the courthouse, just the town clerk's office. And then finally, there have been a bunch of questions about whether or not city halls will be renting out space. Again, this is a good question for you to call up your specific city hall because I think they'll probably be doing it on a case-by-case -case basis. There was another one more question that just came in as to whether or not Rhode Island allows temporary officiants. For example, um, officiants who just have that ability to marry people for 24 hours. Um, and the answer is no, unfortunately. But you can ask for special permission um, from the legislature to be able to marry somebody. And I would recommend that you uh, get in touch with your local representative about possibly being able to do that. All right, so moving forward. Um, there are a number of questions about what does this mean for couples who are already in civil unions. Um, so, for example, um, one question uh, asked, I'm already in one of the 62 civil unions in Rhode Island. What is it I need to do to change it to a marriage? So if you're already in a civil union that you got from Rhode Island as opposed to another state, and that's very important, it has to be a Rhode Island civil union, um, it's very simple. You can simply go to the clerk's office and go through the exact same process that everyone else does for a marriage license, fill out the application, pay the fee, um, and then have it solemnized and have it returned to the town clerk's office. And basically, that's it. You are now married, and that civil union will turn into a marriage. So you don't have to worry about what happens to that civil union. However, if you don't want all the fuss, if you've already had a ceremony or two or three at this point, um, you don't want to actually find an officiant, um, you can actually ask the clerk to just automatically convert that civil union into a marriage. 
um, and we um, anticipate the clerk's offices will have a separate form for that, hopefully, um, where it'll be very easy for someone just to say, go ahead, just turn my civil union into a marriage, and um, the other benefit of doing it that way is there's actually no additional um, licensing fees if you just have it converted. So that is what you can do if you are already in a Rhode Island civil union and you want to get married. Now, we had got another question um, from somebody saying, my wife and I were married in Massachusetts. Um, and we also have a civil union in Rhode Island because Mass uh, Rhode Island didn't recognize that civil union. Should we leave our Rhode Island civil union as is? Right? So this is a situation where someone has, is already married and they have a civil union in Rhode Island as well too. And what should they do about that civil union? Um, now, I think that there's probably a few different considerations there. For the most part, it probably won't make a difference because civil unions will still be treated as marriages in Rhode Island, and so you'll just be treated as marriage, married. Um, the only downside for leaving that civil union in Rhode Island in place is that if you move out of Rhode Island um, and you break up, then you're in the situation of having to dissolve that civil union from Rhode Island in addition to getting divorced. Um, and dissolving civil unions in other states may be more complicated um, than getting divorced in other states. Okay, um, So if you're thinking about moving out of the state of Rhode Island to a state that may not recognize your civil union, um, and this is regardless of whether you got your civil union for Rhode Island or Vermont or New Hampshire, you may want to think about just dissolving it anyway um, assuming you're already married as well too, just so that in case in the future you things don't work out, you break up, you want to dissolve all your legal relationships, you don't also have to think about getting rid of that civil union as well too. Um, so for folks who have out-of-state civil unions, so they have a civil union from Vermont, let's say, um, what do they have to do? Um, so you have a civil union from Vermont, um, you're now living in Rhode Island, um, again, you can get married in Rhode Island um, as long as that civil union in Vermont is with the same person. If it's not with the same person, then you're going to have to dissolve that civil union in Vermont first before you can marry that different person in Rhode Island. Luckily, Vermont actually just passed a law that said that even though you're not a resident in Vermont, which is normally necessary for you to get a divorce or a dissolution in Vermont, if you got your civil union in Vermont or if you got married in Vermont, then you can go to Vermont court to get that civil union or um, marriage dissolved as well too. Um, but we also believe that Rhode Island courts should also be dissolving civil unions. Um, and if you have any problems with the Rhode Island court refusing to dissolve a civil union, please do call our info line at GLAD because we definitely want to hear about that. So then there are questions about interstate and federal recognitions of civil unions. So again, for those individuals, individuals who are civil unions but are not married, um, there are certain benefits to getting married over civil unions. Um, and one of them is that marriages are just more, rec more universally recognized throughout the country. And so if you go to a state, they may not know or care to recognize what a civil union is. So you may have an easier time having your marriage recognized in another state than a civil union. And then finally, most of the federal benefits and responsibilities um, that protect families at the federal level do require marriage. And so marriage is a very important portal for those protections. Now there are some exceptions and social security benefits is one of those exceptions where social security has begun to recognize some civil unions or domestic partnerships uh, for purposes of survivor and spousal benefits and social security. Um, but the surefire way to have uh, access to all those many valuable federal protections and benefits is through marriage. So hopefully that answers your questions about civil unions. Oh, there was a question about uh, domestic partnerships in other states. Domestic partnerships in other states, such as those um, in um, Colorado um, or Colorado calls them domestic partnerships, not civil unions, I believe. Um, maybe they call them civil unions. There are actually not that many states left that call them domestic partnerships. California was one of them, but now California has marriage. If you do have a comprehensive domestic partnership in other states, that should be treated the same as a civil union in, Vermont, in Rhode Island and treated as a marriage as well, too.
So the next slide moving forward is about going to the chapel part two. So now you've gotten your marriage license and your certificate and you need to have it solemnized. Um, and you're thinking um, about perhaps going to have a religious ceremony, whatever else. Um, I know this was a big issue during the debates on uh, over the legislation. Um, and I just want to touch briefly about what ultimately panned out. So with regards to churches, um, all churches, synagogues, mosques have the ability under the Constitution to refuse to marry anyone they want. That is part of the free exercise of religion in our country. And so um, uh, certainly um, um, if you go to a church and they say, no, we won't marry you, um, there's not much you'll be able to do in that situation. Uh, now the question is a little more complicated when it comes to religious organizations um, and the entities, nonprofit entities that are owned or controlled by religious organizations or by churches. So for example, I got there was one question as to whether hospitals with religious affiliations will be able to deny visitation to a legally married same-sex spouse. And the answer should be no. Um, now of course this hasn't been tested in Rhode Island yet and so if you have been denied visitation, please do call our info line. We very much want to hear about those instances of discrimination. But the answer should be no. There are exemptions for religious organizations and their nonprofit entities, but they only pertain to the celebration and promotion of marriage only. So unless you're going to the hospital and asking them to actually get married in their hospital chapel, um, the hospital should not have, um, there's very few areas where the hospital should be able to um, disregard your marriage, if at all. The same is true for fraternal benefit organizations, um, such as the Knights of Columbus. Um, first of all, there, so there were some religious exemptions that were passed for um, fraternal benefit organizations, but first of all, those fraternal benefit organizations have to be religious in nature, and again, it's limited to only a few areas where they can um, discriminate against same-sex couples wanting to marry, and that's with regards to the celebration and promotion of those marriages. Um, and it also uh, uh, relates to the mem their membership or insurance benefits. So the fraternal benefit um, organization can refuse to allow uh, uh, a spouse to be a member, a same-sex spouse to be a member, or to receive insurance benefits through the Knights of Columbus if they want to. Um, but these exemptions are very narrow. And so again, if you do have instances of discrimination in these areas, definitely please let us know. Um, finally, um, private wedding vendors, wedding, wedding vendors such as florists and caterers who have nothing to do with religious entities do not have the right to discriminate against you simply because they do not believe that gay people should have the rights to marry. If you encounter this situation, please do call us. We want to hear about that. All right, to one of my favorite songs. So what does it mean once you get married? Um, both at the federal level as well as in the interstate level. So as many people know, um, the U.S. Supreme Court decided in the case Windsor versus the United States to overturn the Defense of Marriage Act. What does that mean? It means that for purposes of all the federal benefits and responsibilities of marriage that are at the federal level, um, your marriages should be recognized. And that um, goes back to the slide I had before with regards to Social Security, taxes, family medical leave, federal employee um, um, health benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, there is going to be some clarification required from the Obama administration going forward as to how they'll implement this. And it's mostly with regards to where um, the couple lives. So for those of you who live in Rhode Island, you're fine. Because you live in a state that recognizes your marriage, you should be able to be eligible for all those federal protections and benefits that come with marriage at the federal level, provided you meet all the other eligibility requirements as well, too. The tricky part comes if you live in a state that does not recognize your marriage, such as Texas, let's say, for example. And in that situation, some programs will look to the state of residence as to whether or not the federal government will recognize that marriage. And so this is where we are awaiting um, further clarification from the Obama administration as to which programs will follow what we're calling a state of residence rule. We are excited that um, there has been some clarifications already. So um, OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, which um, um, takes care of all the federal benefits for federal employees, has said that they will look at the state of celebration 
uh, for purposes of federal employees. So if this federal employee was married in a state that would allow them to get married, then they will be considered married for all of the federal purposes of federal employee health benefits and whatnot. Same thing with immigration. The Department of Homeland Security just released um, their guidance saying that the uh, immigration um, services will look at the state where you got married for purposes of allowing you to sponsor your, your same-sex um, foreign national spouse. Um, that being said, in Social Security, uh, there is actually a statute that says that Social Security will look at your state of residence, not your state of celebrations. Um, and so this is something that we uh, would like to see more um, information about from the Obama, Obama administration as to whether or not there, there's any ways to get around that rule. Um, the other area where it's a little unclear still is with taxes, um, whether or not the IRS will look at the state of celebration or the state of residence. Um, but for those of you who live in Rhode Island, um, again, this isn't an issue unless you move out of the state to a non-recognition state. There are a lot of questions about taxes, which I'll get to in a second, so just hold off on those for a little while. Um, but um, in general, uh, yes, you will now have to file your taxes as federally as married at the federal level. Um, and so the last thing which I would just point out is that we actually have a publication that goes into this in more detail at GLAS website. It's called After DOMA, What It Means for You, and we will certainly make sure to send that link out to all of you after this program as well too. And we'll be updating that document as well too as we get more information from the Obama administration. So we third poll question, how many of you are married and have been denied spousal health benefits from your private employer. Um, we absolutely want to hear from you if this has been the case because we're very interested um, in learning about these instances of discrimination because in the next slide we're going to be talking about health insurance benefits. So for federal employees it's now very easy. You should be able to add your spouse to your health insurance benefits without any problems regardless of where you live. Um, for state and municipal employees in Rhode Island, you should be able to do the same as well, too. So that's also fairly uncomplicated. Um, for private health insurance benefits, um, so you work for a private employer, it's a little more complicated. Um, and um, I'm going to go over it very quickly, but we, again, have another publication on GLAD's website about health insurance benefits that we encourage you to take a look at. But it comes down to whether or not your health insurance benefit um, plan is an insured plan or a self-insured plan, and the easiest way to find this out is just to ask your HR person whether it's insured or self-insured. If it's an insured plan, what that means is that it's regulated by state law, Rhode Island law, and um, Rhode Island has protections against discrimination in employment for, sex, for gay and lesbian people, and so those health insurance plans should be providing you the same spousal health insurance benefits that straight employees receive. Now, if it's a self-insured plan, then it's a little more complicated because self-insured health insurance plans, which generally are the plans that larger multi-state employers have, um, those plans are regulated by federal law, not state law. And because there are no federal employment discrimination protections for gay and lesbian people, it will be harder to, uh, to argue to your employer that they're legally obligated to provide you the same spousal benefits. Again, if you are being denied health insurance benefits from a private employer for your same-sex spouse, please let us know right away. Finally, um, there are um, now federal uh, protections available now that DOMA is no longer the, um, the law. With regards to COBRA, you should be able to continue your spousal health insurance benefits even if you leave your employment. With HIPAA, that allows you to apply for spousal health insurance benefits during qualifying events such as marriage. Family Medical Leave Act, the ability to take care of your spouse if they're ill. And then finally, as the Affordable Care Act gets implemented in um, Rhode Island and other states, um, there are some issues that are very that are unique to the Affordable Care Act. Again, this is an area that's changing, so please do check back for more information. Um, but it may be the case um, that getting married, if you don't have health insurance and you anticipate having to purchase that health insurance through the state exchange, um, the government, federal government, will provide premiums or subsidies for you to be able to afford those health insurance um, benefits if you are under 400 percent of the poverty line. But if you are married, they will take into account both of your salaries in that determination of eligibility. For, so for some couples, especially those couples that have similar incomes, it may actually serve to disqualify you 
um, for those um, subsidies and premiums um, for the Affordable Care Act. Um, again, it's a complicated area of law, so please do check our website for more information. So the next area which a lot of people had questions about is with regards to taxes, of course. So uh, with regards to your state and federal taxes, you if you live in Rhode Island, work in Rhode Island, then you will now be filing your taxes as married in Rhode Island. And that includes for the 2013 calendar year because the federal tax um, uh, laws um, determine your marital status as to the last day of the tax year, which would be December uh, 31st, 2013. So yes, you will be filing as married. Um, what does that mean? It means you can pull your deductions finally. It means you can make contributions to a spouse's IRA. Um, how it affect your bottom line honestly will depend on your relative incomes, um, whether or not your incomes are very different or very similar. Um, so again, we really encourage people to talk to their accountants to make sure that you're dotting all those I's and crossing all those T's. Um, gift and estate taxes is another um, area that we had a lot of questions about. And so gift, um, the marital exemption in gift and estate taxes will now apply to same-sex couples, thanks to Edie Windsor, who uh, hopefully will be getting a very sizable check back from the department, uh, from the Treasury Department. Um, so what does that mean? It means that you no longer worry, have to worry about documenting every single gift that you give to your spouse or being able to um, purchase um, property and have both your names on the title, even if only one of you contributed to the down payment or to the mortgages. Um, and then, of course, at death, if you bequeath your estate to your spouse, um, you will no longer have to pay the estate tax on that bequest. Um, Finally, the area that probably affects the most people is with regards to the imputed taxation of health insurance benefits. So again, for those who may not be familiar with this, prior to DOMA um, being overturned, um, employers had to um, compute the fair market value of any spousal health insurance benefits that you're receiving, add it to your W-2 at the end of the year, and then you would essentially be taxed on that phantom income. That will no longer be the case anymore. Um, there is some question as to this tax year as to whether or not um, you should be um, having that um, spousal health insurance um, um, value imputed to your taxes for the beginning of this tax year until now or until the, um, the Supreme Court issued the decision. We hope for uh, confirmation from the IRS, but we do believe that you should not be imputed uh, have any income imputed for any spousal health insurance benefits that you got for this entire calendar year because, again, the IRS will take your marital status um, from um, as to the last day of the calendar year. And so if you are married by the last day of this calendar year, um, then none of that um, phantom income should be added to your taxes. Um, the last thing which I want to say, we have another publication on GLAD's website um, that talks a little bit more about this. Um, but for those of you who may have been harmed i.e. you paid more taxes because the federal government did not recognize your marriage, you do have a three-year window right now to go back to your tax returns, amend them, and ask for a refund. So starting with the tax returns from 2010, I would work with an accountant to see whether or not you were actually harmed because of DOMA, and if you were, then to um, file that amended tax return and the request for a refund as quickly as possible. Again, if you need referrals to tax attorneys or accountants, please do call our info line again. And just give me one second while I take in a few more questions that have just come in. All right. Well, for those of you who just asked those questions, they seem very specific. So again, I would just recommend that you call our info line with those very specific questions. But I'm going to move on because we are getting close to the end of the hour. So the next slide. So first comes love, then comes marriage, and as we all know, the baby carriage. <laughs> so um, this is really honestly, um, in all seriousness, uh, the most important um, topic that I want to cover in this webinar, uh, which is the protections that are so important for parents and their children. Um, and so let's start first with, uh, with regards to um, parents who haven't had an adoption done yet um, and who have children. So for children born prior to marriage, without that adoption, you have very 
few protections for both the parents with regards to the relationship with the child. Um, there is de facto parentage protections in Rhode Island, um, but that can easily be overturned or it may not actually be recognized outside of Rhode Island. For children born after marriage, you have some stronger protections, i.e. any child born into a marriage, um, both spouses are presumed to be the legal parent of that child. Um, but again, that presumption can be overturned and it may not be recognized outside of Rhode Island. Um, and so um, again, it is so important um, to um, do an adoption because that is the most, uh, that is the surest way for you to ensure that both of you have a legal relationship with your child, which is why, again, we love to refer to our belt and suspenders approach, as John Withgow is reminding us here, um, which is that even if you're married, even if both your names are on a birth certificate, um, that adoption, there is no substitute for an adoption um, because the adoptions have to be recognized across state lines um, and there's no overturning or reversing an adoption as long as it was procedurally done well, um, correctly. Um, so we had one question from an individual saying that they are expecting the first child, uh, Mazel tov. If we get married, will we be able to, will we both be able to be on the birth certificate? And the answer is yes. If you are married and you have a child, then both of your names will be on the birth certificate. All right, so the next slide. Um, so with marriage often comes divorce. Um, and while it's not something that most people like to think about, um, uh, it's one of the valuable protections of marriage actually is when you break up, having rules in place uh, to order your affairs, disentangle your finances, et cetera. Um, so with regards to jurisdiction, I know many couples have been waiting to be able to get divorced in Rhode Island for a long, long time, and that's been incredibly disruptive to your lives. Finally, starting August 1st, for those couples who have um, separated and are looking for a divorce, you will be able to get a divorce starting in August 1st. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at another question here. And that includes if you're married in another state and you want to come to Rhode Island and get, to, or you live in Rhode Island, and that's, this is the state where you want to get divorced as well too. Provided that the um, your other spouse is living in Rhode Island as well too, or has some connection with Rhode Island, because Rhode Island courts generally need to have some um, reason to assert jurisdiction over both parties. Um, now. I, I touched about, about on this in the beginning. Um, I'll touch about it again. Um, if you get married and you move out of Rhode Island and you break up, that can cause some complications with regards to divorcing or dissolving your marriage, especially if you live in a non-recognition state as well, too. So you really want to think about, you may want to think about those things if you are thinking about moving out of the state. Um, another aspect about divorce that may be a little unclear going forward, um, but we really want to hear from you of, of, with regards to any issues that may arise is with regards to the length of the marriage. So family courts will look to the length of the marriage for purposes of alimony and dividing property and whatever else. Um, we believe that they should not just look to the length of the marriage since many couples in Rhode Island couldn't marry until very recently or on August 1st, but they should look in the entire relationship um, uh, or the entire committed relationship. This is what many courts in Massachusetts are doing, and we believe Rhode Island courts can do the same. And so if you're in this situation and the court is not looking at the entire relationship that they should be looking at, please do let us know. Again, divorce, um, the pr divorce protections are really important with regards to how you divide visitation and custody for children. Um, and so I'll actually get to this in the next slide, so let's skip that for a second. And then finally, um, we talked about this a little bit before, but if you do break up, um, you do have to, and you want to disentangle yourselves legally, if you have a civil union and a marriage, you have to be able to, um, you, you need to dissolve or, um, both of those legal statuses to be free, entirely free from each other. Now, if you got married in multiple states, then you just need to do one divorce. That's fine. Um, but if you have a domestic partnership, a civil union, and a marriage, um, unfortunately, uh, you will have to um, get all three of those dissolved. Um, and it will depend as to where you can do it. Some states will allow you to do it where you got the civil union. Uh, like I said, with Vermont, if you got a civil union in Vermont, and you can go back to Vermont if you uh, to get that civil union dissolved if you live in a state that wouldn't do it otherwise. Um, some people may be stuck, unfortunately, though, if you move to a state that doesn't recognize civil unions or marriage, and you break up, um, it may be very challenging for you to dissolve those situations. 
All right. So moving on, I know there's a lot of questions, which, again, we recommend that you call the info line. Um, but we're just getting to the very last slides here. So this is incredibly important for those of you who may be divorcing or separating and have children, which is to do what really is in the best interest of the child. Um, and GLAD has a publication called Protecting Our Families, Standards for LGBT Families. And we really do think this is incredibly important for our community, um, for us to recognize the rights of both parents, regardless of whether or not you are the biological or non-biological parents. There have been some very distressing cases of biological um, parents who deny that the non-biological parent is a legal parent and then deny any visitation or custody. Um, this is not only bad for the family and the child with regards to continuity, but it's also bad for our legal rights as well, too, because we're fighting really hard for courts to recognize both parents as parents. So we ask all of you to support the rights of LGBT parents, to honor existing relationships regardless of whether or not there's an adoption or not. And then finally, do your best to maintain continuity for the children, because that really is in their best interest. So just looking at the bigger picture now, um, many of you may be wondering, what's next? Um, so we have 13 states in the District of Columbia that allow gay couples to marry, but we have 20, 29 states that have constitutional amendments prohibiting gay couples from marrying. Uh, the Supreme Court has refused to answer the question of whether or not couples have the state right to marry um, in the Perry case. And so what's going to happen is that there will be lots of work still to do in the next few years. Um, through litigation, there are a number of lawsuits that are still challenging discriminatory state marriage laws. Um, legislation, I believe Illinois may, is, may consider their marriage um, bill coming up very soon, as will Hawaii and New Jersey. And then finally, um, we will need to go back to the ballot box in many states, considering the number of constitutional amendments. So I believe Oregon is next up in 2014 to try to repeal their constitutional amendment. Given all this work, it is so important for you to support LGBT organizations if you want to contribute and continue the momentum that we have in this movement. And so please consider organizations like GLAAD and like Marriage Equality, Rhode Island, um, and national organizations as well, too, because this fight is not over. There is still so much to do. And I think one of the biggest dangers is to assume that this is inevitable and will happen on its own, because it certainly hasn't up until this point, and it's required a lot of work from a lot of people. And we can only do that work with your support. And then finally, the most important way to advance our cause and with regards to marriage is to share your story and to share your love. Um, a lot of people like to say that people are most likely to support LGBT rights if they know someone who's gay. We actually have studies um, that show it's not just knowing people who are gay, but actually talking to people who are gay and what their lives are like. So talk to your coworkers, talk to your relatives, your family members, your neighbors about what your lives look like being a gay committed um, couple. And that brings us to the end of our um, presentation. Um, so again, GLAD's legal info line is there for you with any further follow-up questions. Please do call us. Um, and on the last slide, we also have other ways to get in contact with GLAD, Marriage Equality Rhode Island, and Rhode Islanders United for Marriage. Find us on Twitter, find us on Facebook, call us, email us. We are here as a resource for you. So again, Thank you so much all for participating in this webinar. I know we covered a lot of ground um, very quickly, um, but um, there is the publication, GLAD's publication on our website, which goes over everything I just talked about, and you can also call us um, as well, too. And then finally, we'll be sending out links to all of the various other publications that I mentioned in this um, presentation as well, too. So thank you guys so much. Congratulations for those of you who are getting married. Congratulations to those of you who already are. Um, and looking forward to a wonderful, joyous day on August 1st.